The Word of God I'd like to lay on your heart this morning, the Gospel, Luke chapter 1. I will just remind you of verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So far, God's word. My friends in Christ, you see, that's why I didn't want to tell you. I need you to try to talk me out of it. When I was in college, I had a very good friend. I'll call her Maggie. That's not her real name. Change to protect the innocent. Maggie and I were good friends, even though society would not have said that it should have been possible. First of all, Maggie was a female and I was a male. I was going to Northwestern College, which was pretty much an all-male school. However, on that campus was also Northwestern High School, and the high school had both male and female students. But of course, college students and high school students didn't really intermingle much. Furthermore, Maggie was a C. What does that mean? Well, when I asked one of my friends, he said that CP stood for a city people. You see, I was a dormie. I lived in the dorms, but Maggie was a C. City person. So what was this college male dormy doing as a friend of a high school female C? But nevertheless, we were pretty close friends. Our senior year, my senior year of college, her senior year of high school, she got a boyfriend, one of my classmates, and so we didn't hang out together quite as much as we had in the past. We were still friends, but um, I was kind of a third wheel, so our friendship kind of put on bad burner and I hung out with other friends. I don't remember where we were going, but I remember that Sko and I were in the back seat, and Maggie and, we'll call him Joey, that's not his name either, but uh, Joey were in the front seat, and Maggie announced that she was pregnant. And I don't know why, but my very first thing that came out of my mouth is, you know, of course, abortion is not an option. And I remember her looking at me in the rearview mirror and saying, see, that's why I didn't want to tell you. I knew you'd try to talk me out of it. So how do you react to that? What would you say? How would you respond? I don't know the exact words that I gave, but I know the gist of what I answered. The gist of it was, I know that abortion seems like it might be the best answer. It certainly would be the easiest. It would make all the problems go away and we could continue with life as normal. But that is not the best option. What the pro-choice people do not tell you is about the guilt that comes when you murder an innocent baby. Sometimes that guilt can be overwhelming. It has even driven some people to suicide. It would be far better to keep this baby. And yes, it's going to change your lives. It's going to ruin what you had planned for your lives. But God knows what he's doing. Trust him to carry it out. I'd like to say that was the end of the matter. It was for that evening. I don't think we really discussed it much beyond that. But, all in all, they decided not to have an abortion. In our text for today, we have an equally uncomfortable situation. Not Maggie, but Mary. Now, it's really kind of stark, especially when you read it in the context of what had come just before. Just before, we had an elderly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
They had been wanting a child for a long time, especially in that culture where if you don't have children, um, barrenness is a sign that God doesn't like you, and, and so it was very shameful and, and disgraceful not to have children. So they wanted a child. They'd been praying for a child for a long time. And finally, Zechariah, who was a priest, by the way, was doing his priestly duties in the temple, and all of a sudden an angel appears to him, Gabriel. And Gabriel says, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah's response literally is, according to what am I going to know this? I'm an old guy. It doesn't make sense. I don't know if that's possible. And Gabriel told him, well, it's going to happen. And you want to know how you're going to know about it? Fine. You, a priest, won't be able to speak until your baby is born. We'll call him John. And sure enough, Zechariah went and he couldn't speak. He had to use writing implements even to tell everybody what the name of his baby was going to be. But after that baby was born, and after he confirmed his name is John, just like the angel said, his tongue was loose, and the priest could once again speak. What a wonderful story. Now Luke continues the story with Gabriel once again being sent. But this time, not to Jerusalem, the hub of Jewish culture, the center of, of religion, but no, he gets sent to Galilee, the up north people that are kind of uneducated, Galilee of the Gentiles. You see history, Palestine here, Samaritans, no like Samaritans, Galilee. So for the Galileans to come to the culture of Jerusalem, they had to go through the Samaritan territory. And so we just kind of write them off as, well, Galilee of the Gentiles. They're not really true, good Jewish people. But not only is it Galilee, but Nazareth, the despised town. Somebody pointed out that there is no Old Testament prophet prophecy about the town of Nazareth. Mark seems to, I'm sorry, no, it's Matthew, that says that um, he, this fulfills the prophecy about Jesus. And we can't really find that prophecy. The closest we can think of is perhaps he will be despised. So maybe that word Nazarene means despised one. We know that Nathaniel later would confirm that when um, his brother said, we found the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And his response, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? So now Gabriel goes not from Jerusalem, but now he goes to Nazareth. And not to a priest in the temple, but to a young girl probably in her own home. And now he comes not to a couple that had been praying for a child, but to a young teenage girl who probably thought that a child would ruin her life. So Gabriel shows up to her and says, Sup! God's looking for you. Actually, the words he used were, Rejoice, you who are highly favored. However, that term rejoice doesn't always mean rejoice. Kind of like in our culture when we say, Hey, how you doing? And if they actually answer that, it's like, well, I didn't really want to know. I was just being polite. The same with rejoice. It doesn't always mean rejoice. It's just the way they greeted people. And then that saying about the Lord of you who is highly favored, really it means that God's got his eye on you. God's getting close to you. God's approaching you. God's coming close to you. So when he reads Mary... She is, obviously there is an angel there, and that would be cause for fear, but it doesn't say she was troubled at the angel. It says she was troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this is. So the angel shows up and says, Sup, God's looking for you. She's like, okay, is this a good thing or a bad thing? The angel says, you're going to be pregnant. That be a present that you think she wanted at the time? My friend Maggie certainly did not want that. And our culture is not near as judgmental as they were in that culture. You think this is something that Mary wanted? But, 
when she asks, how will this be? Her, her question is very different from Zechariah. Once again, Zechariah's answer was, according to what am I going to know about this? Her answer is more like, this will be. But how? Since I've never known a man. She doesn't reject it in unbelief. She's just curious. <laughs> never known a man. How am I going to have a baby? And the angel tells her that the Holy Spirit will, first of all, come over you. That word is used, first of all, the word spirit can also be translated as breath or life. And so when the spirit comes over her, it's another way of saying, or it could also be translated, life is going to come over you, almost like the springtime life comes over the earth. That same kind of picture. And the spirit will overshadow you. <coughs> that is also used in, in Moses' books, the Pentateuch, talking about when the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It, it overshadowed the temple. So somehow, the angel says, life is going to come over you, and God is going to overshadow you, fill you up like the, the temple is filled. You're going to give birth to the Holy One of God. You suppose this was a welcomed gift? Something that she'd been praying for? Remember that in the Pentateuch, Moses said that if a woman is caught in adultery, pregnant before Mary, she could be stoned. The Jews brought an adulteress to Jesus, asking, hey, she was caught in the act of adultery. Moses says to stone her, now what do you say? Hoping well, we to get Jesus in trouble. So they still knew that law, they still quoted that law. Jesus, of course, bent down and started writing the ground. We don't know what he was writing, most likely the Ten Commandments, and letting the people realize that they were not without sin either. Finally, he answered, let you who is without sin throw the first stone. Goes back and writing more on the ground, and pretty soon everybody goes away. What, has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus was all about forgiving people, but the point of the matter is that adultery was still frowned on in that culture, and yes, they still quoted Moses that says you should kill an adulteress. So Mary would come back to, guess what? I prayed it by God. Uh-huh. Would you believe it? Did Joseph... Matthew tells us that Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly. Even Joseph didn't believe her. But then an angel came to Joseph and said, Don't be afraid to take her as your wife. What is conceived in her is from God. So Joseph reluctantly took her as a wife and had no relations with her until after the baby was born. So if Joseph didn't really believe her, do you suppose anybody else did? I'm sure that Mary had a very difficult life because of this blessing. But let's not forget that it was a blessing. Recall how and after this she went to visit her and to her, her relative Elizabeth. And the very first thing that happened is how should I be so blessed that the mother of my Lord comes to visit me? Recall that when Mary took Jesus into the temple, not only did Anna, but Simeon also both took the child up and, and praised God and gave her a blessing. Mary herself acknowledged in the Magnificat, which we sometimes sing on Sundays, that the Lord has called her blessed and all generations will call her blessed because she got a blessing from God. Now, how about you? If God were to come up and give you a blessing that really doesn't look like a blessing, but more like stress, a headache, frustration, maybe even something that could be life-threatening, would you answer as Mary did? I am the Lord's servant. Let it be according to your word. Kind of tough to do, isn't it? 
today, five days before Christmas, this text encourages patience. Are you patient? I remember once talking to somebody who said, yes, I'm a very patient person. I love to hunt and to fish, and that has really taught me patience. <laughs> That's not patience. That's waiting. I've been out hunting and fishing and golfing, and in all of those things, there's a lot of waiting, but I'll be honest with you, I really enjoy that kind of waiting. But that's not patience. In Greek, the word patience is long-suffering. <coughs> so when you're sitting in a tree, or sitting on the lake, or on the ice, you're not suffering unless you got dragged out there by your spouse and you really don't want to be there, then perhaps that would be long-suffering. That I could call patience. This text teaches us patience, long-suffering, and waiting to see what blessings God's going to bring about because of it. You know, after my friend Maggie announced that she was pregnant, I really didn't see a whole lot of her. I graduated, she graduated. My classmate Joey he could no longer continue on being a pastor. He got a girl pregnant. He dropped out of school. No idea what happened to him. Didn't really see Maggie a whole lot either, but a couple of years later I did go back to town and I did stop by to see her. And she had a beautiful baby daughter. I'll call her Jerusha, just keeping in this Christmas mock theme. You know, Maggie, Joey, and Jerusha. Well, Jerusha still didn't have any hair, but she was just the cutest little thing. And Maggie said to me, thank you. Thank you for not even letting me consider what I was considering. Yes, this changed my life. Changed Joey's life, too. It certainly did not turn out the way we planned it. But this has turned out to be a real blessing. You know, sometimes God throws monkey wrenches into our plans, and he does it on purpose, because he knows what blessings can come through our suffering. We don't like to suffer, but sometimes God has in mind even greater blessings. I mean, look at Mary in our text. She suffered a lot. Simeon even told him, the sword will pierce your own soul too. But because of her suffering, our Savior was born. Because of her shame, the despised one has become our Savior. And even if we don't see earthly benefits this side of glory, Paul has assured us that the little bit of suffering that we now endure isn't even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So when God chooses to bless you, in ways that you don't think you want to be blessed. Remember this text. Remember Mary, who said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And this Christmas season, may you have the patience of Mary. I guess you could say, have a Merry Christmas. Amen. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost.